You're listening to episode three of the Dogs Are People 2 podcast. I'm your host, Drya Dingle, and I believe anything can be learned. If you believe that's true as well, then keep listening because this is the number one show to bring you the best tips, strategies, and technologies for pet parents. Today, I'm being joined by Charlotte Reeves. She's an award-winning Australian photographer based in Brisbane. Her style incorporates creative use of natural light, location, and expression to produce vibrant and emotive work. Addicted to creating light bulb moments for students, Charlotte has been teaching pet photographers since 2013. She relishes simplifying tricky concepts and helping people achieve their goals of making the learning fun, practical, and positive. You can find her at learnpetphotography.com, but today we're going to be talking about simplifying pet photography for pet parents with Charlotte Reeves. Enjoy the show. For our listeners, or if you're watching this on the replay on YouTube, can you tell us a little bit about yourself Charlotte from LearnPetPhotography.com. Yeah, no problem. I am a specialist pet photographer, pretty much mostly dogs, really. So I suppose I could say I'm a dog photographer. I've been doing this for 13 years. I started off just doing uh, work for private clients and then sort of gradually moved into teaching as I had more other pet photographers asking me questions about what I did. And I felt like I was answering a lot of questions from people and explaining a lot of things about, uh, you know, shooting and editing. So I kind of just naturally progressed into the teaching side of things. I studied photography when I left high school. So I did a two-year diploma of photography. And then I went on to graphic design and website design. And I worked as a designer for a few years. And how I got into dog photography is I got my first dog, a great Dane named Kaya. And I wanted to document the first year of her life because as you know, they start off kind of small and then they get just really big, really quickly. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, they're just so cute. So I just really wanted to document that first year of her life. So I did like a photo a day project thing with her. And I gradually just started taking more photos of her and her doggy friends and friends and family's dogs as well. And eventually kind of just found a photographer in the States actually. And she was a dog photographer. And I was like, oh, wow, there's such a thing as a dog photographer. There kind of wasn't uh, in Australia at that stage. And so I thought, oh, I think I can do that. Because when I studied photography, I never really ended up deciding what I wanted to do with it. I sort of thought about, you know, doing commercial photography. I knew I didn't want to shoot weddings and I just never really settled on anything. And then I felt like when I got my first dog, I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I'm meant to be photographing. And so it kind of just all progressed from there, I guess. You were talking a little bit about going to school for photography and so many folks, you know, just don't any more. When you first started out, was it digital or when you say photography, like dark rooms, like what are we talking? Yeah, talking full film, 35 mil film photography. We also shot more medium format and large format film as well. Um, so I did, I started my diploma of photography in 1999. Um, so I went to 99, 2000. Um, so digital existed, but it was very primitive. It was kind of like one and two megapixels sort of cameras. And it was more like a toy rather than actual, like a serious camera. At that like, we're not really doing um, that right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Um, so yeah, no, so I, I, I guess I cut my teeth on actual film photography and we used to develop um, all our own film, print all our own images. That was kind of how I started out, I guess. Uh, it was. It's definitely a really good base to have because a lot of that, a lot of that stuff that you learn, all the theory behind color theory and things like that, does actually apply to digital. Um, a lot of the tools that you're using in Photoshop actually come from back in the film days. They're kind of named the same kind of thing, but like the digital equivalent. So it's really good to have that knowledge from the past. But yeah, I think today more so, it's a lot of people don't do formal studies in photography. They just kind of learn. That there's so many learning opportunities online these days that you, you kind of almost don't have to. And it's kind of like more practical actually doing it, doing these sorts of studies online or, or, you know, in-person mentoring or workshops and hands-on stuff like that. When did you make the transition? So digital obviously eventually gained some steam um, because I know you have a really big background with uh, Photoshop and Lightroom, even in its early infancy when it had some different titles. So how did that all come about when you made the transition and were like, hey, I'm getting into digital editing and just going down this road. Yeah, well, actually, it was interesting because when I was studying photography and I was shooting film, we actually did used to use Photoshop back then. Um, mm-hmm. So that was Photoshop version 5.5. That was the very first version of Photoshop I ever used. And we used to actually scan in our images and, um, and you know, do what we call spotting, so getting rid of dust spots and sort of that sort of thing that, that would be on the images um, and do basic sort of image manipulation, I guess, but just of the scanned film sort of prints. 
so I guess the period where I moved into design, like graphic design and stuff, that's when it was all kind of transitioning in the background. And then by the time I kind of got into photography again, it was like the only choice really was digital. And I just dove straight into digital and I had a, a Canon 350D. It was, it was a Canon Rebel they're often called as well. Um, so that was like my first digital SLR. So I kind of just dove straight into that. And it wasn't too much of a learning curve, I found, really. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you understand was- light, right? I almost feel like learning just basic non-digital photography, you know, just good old 35 millimeter or whatever you happen to shoot, medium format, yeah. um, definitely helps. Like just myself growing up, um, I know what I look like at every stage of life because I always had a camera <laughs> pointed in my face. Thanks, Dad. Nice. Uh, I always joke that. But, you know, actually it ended up sticking on and I ended up getting into photography. And then I have my best subject ever who never complains, my dog, Disney. Um, yes. But <laughs> just understanding those basics, you know, because we went from having like just a regular film camera to digital and all of a sudden it was big and then it was small and it was compact. And just seeing that yeah. transition, I think it actually helps and it builds on it. And it's really interesting you talked about The Rebel because um, I was just about to ask you, hey, what? so what was your first, like, you know, your intro to the squirrel? What was your first camera? So with that, that's a great transition because um, today yeah. we're talking about simplifying pet photography for, I'm going to say dog owners, but pet parents, a lot of the concepts are the same, um, particularly when it comes to concepts of how we go about I guess sure we capture what they look like in real life and their fur and all these moving pieces. Um, yeah. But with so many gadgets out there, um, I saw your recent review of the EOS R5, which, you know, everybody's dogging it for a film camera, but not too many reviews are out there or unboxings with regard to its characteristics as a really, really awesome photography camera. So, so what would you, yeah. what would be your advice um, for someone who wants to take, you know, something nicer, slightly nicer than a family photo uh, that you just do on, on you know, just want to up their game for a photography camera? What okay, so uh, in terms of like an entry level kind of camera, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess being being involved in like the professional photography world, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty up on the like the professional models. Um, mm-hmm. not quite so versed, well versed in the like entry level cameras, I suppose. Um, but I mean Well, there's some extreme yeah. hobbyists out there. So so give us some of those recommendations as well. Because yeah. you know, I I I'm not good at golf, for instance, but when I go out to the golf range, I'm looking pretty professional. It's not till I take a swing that, you know, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have no hope with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've always found, like, dogs are actually really demanding to photograph, especially if you're photographing dogs in action. Um, I actually think that dogs in action are probably one of the most difficult things um if anything, to like when you're comparing it with like motor racing or football or tennis, any of the other action type things, I actually think dogs are probably right up there with one of the most difficult things. So to do that kind of photography well, I think you really do need to have a decent camera with a good autofocus system. The autofocus system is probably the most important aspect, as well as the frames per second as well, because you basically, you want to have uh, the best chance of capturing like the best shot at the peak of the action, you know, at the top of the dog's stride, at the top of their jump. And if you're shooting with a camera that is quite, has quite a slow frames per second, you don't have as many opportunities to capture that one perfect shot. Whereas if you've got lots of frames per second, Um, you've got a lot of images to choose from. So having a good autofocus tracking system that will be able to track the dog as it moves and also being able to shoot at high frames per second. And when you're sort of looking at cameras that kind of perform well in those aspects, I suppose, you're kind of getting into the like Canon, like 5D sort of series, like the full frame. There's a couple of models. I'm terrible with trying to remember models. There's a couple of models um, that are- It doesn't matter. They'll upgrade tomorrow and then- (laughs) (laughs) It'll all change tomorrow anyway. Exactly. Um, The Canon Canon 7D is also good. I shoot Canon, so I know Canon most, but generally something with a very good autofocus system and lots of autofocus points as well. So when you're looking through the viewfinder, um, lots of different points to choose from um, over a wide range of the viewfinder as well. A lot of the entry level cameras just have like a little cluster of focus points in the center and it's not as flexible for choosing different compositions when you're shooting and also being able to track the dog across the frame as you're shooting action as well so definitely yeah autofocus is probably the most important thing for photographing dogs yeah especially in action and I think it was highlighted in one of your recent videos with regard to I shoot Sony you know 
I I don't know. I, I used to hear all the reviews about how techy this is and oh, it's more of a computer than a camera. And I was like, oh, I so want to take that on. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And some people were like, oh, the menu system, blah, blah, blah. But like any piece of equipment or tool, I would really call it. Um, I think if you take the time to learn it. Um, and yeah, there is a bit of a learning curve and you can customize it. And if I picked up yours, it'd probably be a little bit different than how I have mine set up. So there's that factor. Um, but I personally shoot on a Sony a7R 4 just because just of the high megapixel count. And I personally think if you're going to shoot, you should print your photos. I know, you know, we're in the Instagram generation, but I still take value and like, wow, you know, I, I still get excited and waiting for something to come back because I don't develop my own. It, it's really cool to actually see your, your images come to life. But okay. anyway, Sony was one of those pioneers with regard to the animal eye autofocus. And of course, everyone's yeah. coming along and developing their, their technologies, but that's another kind of like cheat sheet uh, way that I have found, like when I zoom in, I look at his eyeball, for instance, right? We're always trying to think about portraiture. And I was like, wow, like, this is really sharp. This is awesome. Like, so that's another, you know, for those out there, like, hey, what are you looking for? Obviously, you want the camera to feel good in your hand. Um, Because I know, especially uh, for for some folks, the Sony can be a little small, a little bit small in your hand. And if you have like Mm -hmm. larger hands, um, it may not be as comfortable, especially if you're going to be walking around. Like when I when I'm shooting my dog, it is like exercise. I mean, I'm like walking around. I mean, I mean. I mean, if you want to get a static shot, sure. I mean, he'll sit for that or stay. But usually you want to get your dog being a dog. And a lot of times that requires moving around, um, particularly if you're on a manual lens, which I try not to do, but sometimes I I do. And then I'm end up like, I am the zoom, right? So I'm moving in and out and around and trying to get the shot that I'm going for. Um, But speaking of lenses, normally my go-to is really just to go out with like a 24 to 70. What do you typically uh, shoot with, with regard to lens choice? Well, so I like to, um, when I'm shooting a client session, I really like to create variety. So I like to have a variety of different images. I sell a lot of albums um, and Mm -hmm. albums, you you want lots of different like types of shots. Um, So having said that, the lens that's probably most often on my camera is the 70 to 200 millimeter zoom. Um, I find that's a really versatile lens. It's really great for getting close up with portraits. If you get a long way back, it's a really great way of including the dog in the landscape. Um, and it's also perfect lens for action. So it's, it's my action go-to lens. I also have a 24 to 70. Um, I'm actually kind of in the midst of changing my equipment over. As you mentioned, I've just got the Canon R5 and they actually have different lenses for those. So I've sold some lenses. I'm buying some lenses. So I'm a little bit in a transitionary period at the moment with lenses, but I love the zoom. So I call the, the workhorse zooms are the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200. And that basically covers you a, a huge range of focal lengths. Having said that, I also really love prime lenses as well. Um, So fixed focal length lenses, especially because they allow you to use a really shallow depth of field. And I really love that look of a really sharp face or just sharp eyes and a really blurry background. The 35mm f1.4 prime and my other favorite is the 135mm f2 prime. I've also just got a 50mm f1.2 for the new camera. And oh my gosh, I love it so much. It's just nifty 50, nifty 50. (laughs) Yes. Oh gosh, it's amazing. It's like it's like this big, but yeah, it's fantastic. So Canon had uh, three different 50 mil lenses for the the regular digital SLRs. Um, I didn't like any of them because I'm a pixel keeper and I'm really all about quality. And none of them quite measured up to my very high standards. <laughs> Um, so when I switched to the mirrorless Canon, I was like, okay, I'm getting the the new 50, and it's just it's mind blowingly amazing. I love it so much. So, okay. Um, so let's circle back. So basically we, we figured out, uh, that we're looking for a really good autofocus in the camera. That's something that you want to be looking for. Cause I could get really into this, right? Cause we're both like really into it. And, I um, <laughs> yes, I do. I do. And, um, those are a couple of great lens recommendations. And then obviously the higher end glass is going to cost a little bit more than like the entry level, but of course, start with what you have because the basics or the principles of photography are going to remain the same. And of course you can always get a better, faster, sharper, you know, more pristine, um, lens yeah. and then feeling yeah. your hand and just being comfortable with the system that you're on. We talked about some of the differences yes. between maybe the Canon systems, which generally are known for just being plug and play. Most people can pick them up and figure them out. And I would say that Sony, they've made a lot of improvements. I still don't think it's quite like that, but 
if you've been in the Sony ecosystem, and and not to say that there aren't other brands, right? Because Nikon has been in the photography game, not so much known for their video as much as the others, but you know, Nikon's really great, have a lot of great series with regard to their photography cameras. Let's talk, like, let's back it up a little bit. And if we're talking about you know, for for those who may just be getting in the possibly shooting manual or understanding some of the modes on their camera and what basic uh, aperture or shutter speed or things like that that we're talking about, particularly as it relates to, let's just say, shooting dogs and dogs in action, something that you're kind of known for. All right, cool. So I actually shoot on manual exposure. So I, um, I actually, I probably about 99% of the time I'm on full manual. So I actually choose the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed, depending on the situation. So how I actually choose those settings uh, is based on whether I'm shooting portraits or action, like you said. Um, so I'd, I tend to try and keep that shutter speed. The shutter speed is, is probably the most important when you're photographing dogs because they're fast moving. And even when they're sitting still, dogs aren't actually 100% still. They're breathing, they're moving, they're going back and forth, their eyes are flicking around, their ears are flicking, like they're constantly in motion. So shutter speed is probably the most important for actually getting a sharp image because getting a sharp image image is probably the thing that people struggle with the most. Blurry photos, they're just, they're they're really common when you're first starting out. And that's often caused by a shutter speed that's too slow. So I don't really like to go below about one five hundredth of a second. Even with the dog still (laughs) sitting there, like for a portrait sort of shot, definitely. You still got that pant. Sorry. No, you still got that pant. You know, your dog's always just, oh, you know, yeah. taking it in. They're living things. They're not static objects. Like, they're yeah. just constantly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't go below um, one five hundred per second. Um, for action, it does definitely needs to be faster. It does depend on the type of action. So the shutter speed that you need to freeze, say, the dog running towards you versus the dog running across the frame in front of you um, varies a little bit. So a really popular kind of image to take is a dog running straight towards you because that gives you the most expression. It gives you eye contact. That's the sort of image that I always absolutely love to take of people's dogs. So for that kind of thing, you don't want to go below one one thousandth of a second, preferably faster. So preferably as fast as you possibly can given the light and the other settings. As far as aperture goes, I'm pretty much always shooting what they call wide open so at the the largest available aperture which is actually the smallest number which is Mm. super confusing so I'm pretty much always shooting at like f2.8 with my zoom lenses Um, and with my prime lenses I often go down to like whatever it can do so f1.4 or f2 so I find that is really good because it gives the most amount of light onto the sensor so it makes the hole in the lens the largest it possibly can to let the most light in and that allows me to use a fast shutter speed. And then ISO, I basically call the utility setting. It basically is just set to whatever it needs to be to get the correct exposure after you've determined the shutter speed and the aperture. So I guess that's kind of like, I mean, that's if you're shooting on manual. If you're wanting to shoot on an automatic exposure mode, a really common one that people choose is aperture priority. So you set the aperture and the camera decides on the shutter speed and the ISO. Where that can be a bit problematic is if there isn't quite enough light and the camera decides to use a a shutter speed that's too slow because the camera will think oh I can use one one hundredth of a second that's okay and that'll you know that'll be enough to eliminate any camera shake or whatever but it's not enough to eliminate the motion in the actual dog itself often the camera will choose a shutter speed that's a little bit too slow if you're shooting in aperture priority mode if you're shooting in uh, shutter speed priority mode which is often called TV. That's kind of good because you get to choose the shutter speed that you want. And we've discussed how important it is to have a fast shutter speed. Then the camera decides on the aperture, which isn't, you know, which isn't too bad. If you've got a camera that can do it, the the best automatic exposure mode you can possibly do is manual with auto ISO. So basically you choose the aperture and the shutter speed and the camera chooses the ISO. So the ISO is just the utility setting. In a, obviously, a high ISO will give you a, a noisier photo, and a lower ISO will give you a better quality photo. But if you can, if you can choose those two really important settings that you need to shutter speed and aperture, and the camera chooses the ISO, that's pretty much the best possible automatic exposure mode that you can use. That's and you really can also nice cheat thing. a little bit. I don't know if all cameras do it, but you can bracket in, you know, either your ISO or say your 
I would say you want to choose your shutter speed, particularly for the dog, but you can bracket that in. So I'll say, yeah, I want you to choose it, but I want you to stay within this range. Um, and so That's oftentimes right. I might do that, uh, particularly, uh, I haven't really done it really necessarily with Disney, but I do that a lot of times when I'm shooting people and it's, and we're moving about, you know, on the go. And it's like, Hey, I know I'm going to range somewhere between here and here, but I know sometimes this camera can get really stupid. <laughs> and then I'll be like, why is this so dark? And it's like, Oh, well, yeah. you know, you told me you wanted this, this, and this. So maybe I'll be like, Hey, just keep this between like two and 800 or whatever, you know, your circumstance yeah. may warrant. So plenty of yeah. YouTube videos out there about that, but look at, you know, bracketing your, your aperture or your shutter speed or whatever may be most relevant. If you know that I know I need to be somewhere within this range, because sometimes the, the I mean, it's just a computer at the end of the day inside with a chip that's doing what it thinks you're trying to do. Um, so if you're not going to completely shoot hundred percent manual, then maybe try to use some of the features of your camera. If you have maybe a slightly higher end camera that can do that for you. So with that, you talked about one of your favorite lenses um, as being the 70 to 200. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of those characteristics with regard to you being out on the scene um, and maybe some of the distance required to get that shot and your interactions with the dog if you do have to have distance between you and the dog to get a photo with such a long lens. I think it's a really good lens, if, especially if you're working with a dog that may, if, if you're working with someone else, it's a bit different if you're working with your own dog, I suppose. But if you're working with someone else's dog and they may be a little bit, you know, some, sometimes dogs have problems and they're a little bit fearful or they just need a little bit of dis- distance between you and them. Um, that lens is absolutely amazing for that kind of situation. On the other end of the scale, it can be a little bit tricky if you're photographing your own dog and your dog doesn't have a good stay <laughs> um, because it can be really difficult to get that distance that you, you need um, because it's such a long zoom lens um, between you and the dog. So I guess that's where the training side of thing comes in. And I know that like that's yes. your forte really. <laughs> Yes. And you know, a lot of people don't even think about that part, particularly just real quick, like, like a down or a sit. If you always do down or sit right next to you, your dog may start to believe that down or sit means down or sit, but it means it like right here in front of you. And that's not necessarily true. So you got to practice, you know, your, your distance commands. Otherwise you might be down and your dog might be like, okay, he'll run all the way over to you and then down right there at your feet. And you're like, "Mm." (laughs) so yeah, definitely a training aspect. Yeah. And stay, stay is the absolute most important thing. I think you you can teach if you want to take really awesome photos of your dog Um, and also stay at different poses as well. So, a down stay, a sit stay, and a stand stay. So I've Which found the that um, even, <laughs> even well-trained dogs and even dogs that do a lot of training with their owner and stuff, they still don't do down stay because it's default for some reason for you to ask your dog to sit and then stay. Not many people say stand and stay. And I love a stand. Like I love a dog standing in an image because I feel like it's a real natural sort of pose. Sitting, mm-hmm. especially with some dogs, look a little bit awkward when they're sitting yes. or they do the thing where they're like slouching to one side and it just looks <laughs> it just look awkward and kind of posed and stuff. Whereas if you can get a beautiful shot of a dog standing, like freestanding, just beautifully there, that actually makes a really great photo. But getting them to stand and stay, that's the, that's the tricky part. Um, so that's probably the, the best thing that I reckon is a good thing to practice with your dog. Actually, yeah. For it's got a lot of utility yeah. too. Cause, uh, some of us get our dogs, uh, groomed and, um, making that process a little bit less difficult for your groomer or yourself yeah. is, is great. I mean, and that's something that you can work on. So it has utility in both getting an awesome photo of your dog, you know, a nice strong yeah. pose. And then also just, you know, something practical. If you want to brush your dog or get their undercoat or, you know, just take yeah. them out somewhere, uh, it's a good you thing know, to, you know, to train want them sitting. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, like it's, it's just default position for most dogs. Like, like I remember finding a, a beautiful golden retriever once and he was absolutely gorgeous and he loved his owners and everything. But like you ask him to do anything, he'd be like, I sit, I sit. <laughs> it was just default. I sit. We could not get that dog to stand. It was really difficult. We had to basically just get him to walk along and then stop and then catch him before he sat. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's the extreme of it. So yeah. let's see. All right. So we, we, we talked a little bit about the lenses and some of the things that with regard to like the basics of aperture ISO and uh, shutter speed yeah. for those out there who may be just getting started, but you want to dive a little bit into the manual settings of your camera, some of the automatic shooting modes. So after we've taken the picture, right after yeah. we've taken the picture, 
what are some tips or things um, that we should be thinking about when it comes to to editing? And you talked briefly, you gave us a little hint, shoot for the edit a little bit, but just yeah. your perspective. And yeah, we'll focus on some of the popular programs like Lightroom or Photoshop. But if you have any others you want to mention, then, then sure, go ahead. Can we backtrack for just a second? Because there's something yes. I really want to mention that's really important. Um, and it does relate to editing as well. Um, so it's light. So working with the light. Um, So that's a really huge part of what I do. I shoot with 100% natural light, so I don't use flashes or anything like that. I don't even even use reflectors because I'm often by myself and and that requires having extra people, extra hands and stuff. Um, So, yeah, it can get a little bit tricky when you're, like, holding the camera a treat and you need three arms basically. (laughs) Exactly. Um, So working, the ability to work with the light is really, really important and that will also help on the editing side of things because, like I said, you, you do have to shoot to edit. And if you want a nice, clean image that you can edit nicely and that will turn into a beautiful shot, it has to be well lit when you take it. You really have to pay attention to um, what your light source is, the direction of where the light is coming from, how bright the light is, uh, and also the quality of the light as well. So it's um, you, you get a very different image if you shoot, you know, midday under full sun versus in the afternoon on a cloudy day, the light's a lot softer and it's also a different colour temperature as well. Um, so cloudy light and shade light is a lot cooler. Um, so when you get to editing those photos, you don't want to warm it up too much because it's not true to the sort of light that it was taken in. Um, so it's really important when you're shooting is to, I guess a couple of main rules is always try and face the pet towards like the light source so often the light source is actually just the whole sky so they face them out towards the whole sky um people sort of tend to have issues um if they're photographing dogs indoors um and and failing to get catch lights and things in their eyes and it's because the dogs aren't facing towards the light so always have them facing towards the light that's really important and lighting is just a, an absolutely huge topic, but um, I just thought I'd, yeah, I just thought I'd. No, no, no. So it. important. You can't talk about photography, whether it be digital or whatever, uh, without talking about the light. Like that's, that's super that's huge. Cause I mean, there's a lot of folks who can do, do plenty without a lot of equipment if they know how to work with the light around them. And that's so critical to discuss for sure. That's right. And you can even get great photos on your iPhone if you know how to work with the light. Once you've got once you've got your images and you're taking them in. So I use um I use Adobe Lightroom and also Adobe Photoshop. They're the two programs that I use. Um I use Lightroom to manage my photo catalog. So it's basically it's my go-to place where all my images are. It's where I edit sessions from start to finish, basically. I cull down images. So I might go out in a session and take 500 photos. I might cull that down to 30 or 40. And then I'll edit them in Lightroom to a point where they're probably about 90% finished. And then I'll take them into Photoshop and just do finishing touches, things like removing leashes, fixing up like eye goobers. They're a good one yes. to, to concentrate on removing the super slobbery tongues um, and then even trickier things like maybe if the owner's standing in the corner of the photo, you can, uh, you can use some content to wear in Photoshop and remove them. And also yeah, and that's when you do some really complicated edits with that. So you take it, you take it deep. Like you can, I, yeah. I don't remember the title of it, but I was watching one and there was all kinds of grass and leaves and we were working with the tree and I was like, oh, she, she's got that Photoshop thing down pat. I might've scrapped that photo. I might've been like, you know what? I should have, I should have put him somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That would have been there to edit my photo one. Yeah. So that was actually someone else's image. And I was like, right, I'm going to make this yes. amazing. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest things that you can do, you talked about removing like grass and trees and stuff like that, is removing distractions in an image. Um, because you want you want the dog to be the main subject. Like you don't want anything else in the image competing for your attention and taking that away from your main subject. So things like it's it's just little things often. Um, if there's like a lamp post in the background, or if you're shooting in a park and there's a rubbish bin, and if it's out, if it's in the background and it's visible but it's kind of out of focus a little bit, you can generally just sort of get rid of it, you know, get rid of it so that it's not distracting there. The other thing is like if you're photographing in long grass and there's a long piece of frond of grass in front of the dog's face, just get rid of it. There's Save so yourself some tools. time, guys. Save yourself some time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there's so many tools in Photoshop now that actually make it super easy to do that. And anything content aware in Photoshop, 
um it's just it's just super quick and super easy these days so i guess why not you know <laughs> makes yeah i mean it's getting better and better uh ai artificial intelligence for those of you not tracking um it's just amazing and they're starting to incorporate that now and then like even if it doesn't quite you can watch some of her videos but even if it doesn't quite capture it initially then you can just go back in and tell it oh this is the area i was trying to focus on and then bam you can snap and then boom, there's your vision. So obviously it's really simple to, again, shoot for the edit and what you can remove, then just go ahead and remove, particularly like something like a rubbish bin, like she was talking about. But yeah, the software um, is getting pretty, pretty awesome right now. Yeah. There's always new updates and stuff. And I guess, I think I'm a like, like you in a lot of ways, like I love technology and I love new features. And if, you know, if something gets updated, I'm like, oh, I need to go and explore that and see what it does. So it's like, oh, there's new Photoshop stuff. Um, so yeah, I love playing around with all the new stuff and they're always bringing out all these great new features and just make things a lot quicker as well. Um, so you're not having to spend hours in Photoshop to to achieve something. You can just get in there, get it done and I guess move on, <laughs> move on with your life. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like just get yeah. it done and then boom. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I mean, so you have your YouTube channel, um, learn pet photography, just tell us a little bit about learnpetphotography.com and like what you're doing in the, in your local area, or I don't know if you work international, but just tell us a little bit about your business and, and, and what you have going on. Okay, cool. Um, so I started off when I started off teaching, I wrote an ebook called fetching photos. Um, and it was basically just like a guide to dog photography. Um, I then went and wrote another ebook, um, which is called dog shots, which is 30 different ideas for 30 different types of shots that you can take and you know how to take them, the settings that you need to use and all that sort of stuff. Um, so after doing those ebooks, it kind of just moved I moved into a lot of different things. So I've been teaching at workshops. There's a couple of other photographers in the States who I teach international workshops with. We call them the Barker workshops because it's just the way that we name them. So the first one was at Barcelona. We called it Barcelona. Um, and then we did then we did Costa Rica. So that was Barca Rica. And then we did France, which was Bark Shore. Uh, and then we did New Zealand. So that was Bark Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> we have I love it stuff, as you can see oh to dogs um, I'm feeling it I'm feeling it yeah yeah so we're actually meant to do two this year we were meant to do one in Scotland and which is Barklander um and then we were meant to go back and do another one in Spain but obviously that hasn't happened hopefully next year that will happen um they're super fun I mean they're just so much fun we have we do two weeks we have 15 people it's all inclusive everyone stays at the same place so we go out and shoot together we edit together we do business stuff um, so absolutely love those workshops. Um, I've also taught at other workshops. I do private mentoring, so in-person mentoring, so people can come to me. I've also done a little bit of mentoring in the States and around Australia as well. And then I've got my online courses as well. So Real Shoots is probably like, it's like the best one that I've ever done. Um, so it was actually a series of 10 photo shoots with you know, clients, dogs. And basically I had videographers come out and film me just do the photo shoot from start to finish. So a two hour photo shoot condensed into like a 30 minute episode, kind of like a reality show, Netflix style series. So heaps of fun to do. Um, a little bit daunting, I think as well, when I first started out doing those, but you know, I got But it's good to, to it. take on a project. Um, I think you got like some oh. sneak peeks, right? On your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. There's some sneak peeks and um, teasers and stuff on my YouTube channel for those. So you can check those out if you want. But yeah, they're really good. And so for each episode, for each shoot, I also did a couple of editing tutorials uh, from images from the shoot. Um, and there's like, you know, there's a quiz and all sorts of other stuff, goodies that you can sort of get stuck into for each episode. And then I've got my working with natural light course as well. That dives very, very deep into the lighting side of things and working with natural light and getting the best possible images that you can while you're shooting to actually kind of cut down your editing time. So you're, you know, not having to fix lighting and stuff while you're editing. Because I guess that's probably my, like, my biggest thing that I kind of try and concentrate on is getting a really good image in camera. So I'm not in front of the computer as much, I guess, because I'd much rather be out shooting than sitting exactly. inside, like fixing my photos in Photoshop. So um, yeah, that working with natural light course is a really good one for that. Just helps you improve your skills 
um, while you're actually shooting, which is awesome. Yeah, we definitely can't overstate how important understanding the light is. Um, and sometimes I just have to go back to like the basics. Um, cause sometimes, you know, I, I shoot on auto every now and then, like I'll go to, to aperture priority. Cause sometimes I just want to, to get the shot, you know, I just want to get the shot and I want to see some photos. Um, cause sometimes I actually enjoy the, the editing process, but whether it's photography or video, it's always better to get the shot in camera. And then you can kind of bring out more of those creative aspects, um, in the editing process. And sometimes you get in the, in the, at least in the edit, at least for me, I might fix a few things. And sometimes it actually just looks good on its own. It's like, I'm not going to over-process this. It's like, it's okay, it. we yeah. actually got it. We got the exactly. image. Um, so yeah, check out those resources. Those are such great value added. Um, we're going to try something, um, the lightning round, uh, with okay. a couple of, you don't have to answer fast, uh, but there's a couple of questions. And I just want to see how this is going to go. So we're trying a few okay. things on the podcast. Um, so here we go. It's five okay. questions. Ready? Ooh. Yep. What is the toughest part about being a pet photographer? Oh, this is really sad, but it's when, when people lose their dogs, I think is mm. the, the sad thing. Or when you're doing an end of life session, um, that's really tough. It's, um, yeah, it's you're difficult. right. We yep. can't beat that one. All yep. right. Your favorite pet photography, YouTube resources. Oh my gosh. Who do you like on YouTube? <laughs> Obviously you, of course, learn pet <laughs> photography, but after, but after that, what are some things that maybe you might say, mm, maybe check this out? Uh, I actually don't have any. <laughs> no, no YouTube resources. Okay. What other resources, books, authors, tips, places to go? Um, 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 um okay. There's a, there's a really great, uh, Facebook group called Dogs Photography, and it's mostly European dog photographers, and the photos are absolutely beautiful and inspirational. Um, so, yeah, Facebook group Dogs Photography. Love it. Um, that's check it probably, out, guys. Yeah, I'd check that one out. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so th there's, no, there's no rules about this. So you can, like, pass or you can be, like, whatever. Okay. okay, so where do you see the future of Instagram dogs going from here? Is that going to be a thing? of Instagram, Instagram, dogs, famous like, dogs. Like, so people are taking pictures of their dogs and like their dogs have their own Instagram accounts and like, it's like a whole thing. So dogs are on social and basically they're, they're their own stars with like people just taking photos of their dogs. I don't know if you've seen these Instagram pages, uh, for yeah. dogs, but yeah. What do you think? You think that's going to continue? You think that's going to be a thing in the future or do you think it's just a fad? I think, I mean, I think it's been building and I think, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got an Instagram page for my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Fletcher and Opal. And I think we've got like 20,000 followers or something on there. Um, but I, I'm a bit slack with it. Um, but yeah, no, I've seen some pages go absolutely crazy. And I think a lot of the, um, the reason for their success is their collaborations with other businesses um, and sort of features and joint ventures, I guess, between them. And um, I think it's just a really good way of brands connecting with customers. Um, and I think that's only ever going to like grow. <laughs> it's only ever going to grow as long as, um, yeah. I mean, as long as people are of course sort of cross promoting and it's working for everybody, I think it's a really good way of um, bringing a bit of reality, I suppose, to, to advertising and sort of collaborations. So yeah, big thing, getting bigger all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Does your equipment matter for taking photos? Does it matter? iPhone, guess, Sony, I'm Whatever, like yes. when we're talking about taking a photo, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually going to say yes. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's about the photographer. And you know what? It is about the photographer. Yeah. But you also need the right tools for the job. I mean, you don't, I mean, my husband's a mechanic, right? And I can't send him out with like one screwdriver and something to go and work on a car. He needs a full range of tools. He needs the tools that can do, that can match his skills. Um, so same with photography, like, I mean, I can go out and take a really good photo on the iPhone, um, and do a really good job and it'll look nice and everything. But if I want to take a really kick-ass, amazing photo, I need good equipment. Exactly. So, exactly. There is that. so Hey guys, we gave you some tips for getting started as beginners, but just know, Hey, the, the, the farther <laughs> up you go along the path, you're, you're probably going to want to up your, your equipment and your tools just to get the best image possible. Last your one. Tools, what advice would you, what's that? Sorry, no, I was going to say your tools really need to match your um, your experience level. That's probably exactly. the, the final thing of that. Yeah, yeah. No, that <laughs> that totally makes sense for sure. 
Um, what advice would you give your younger former self just starting out in pet photography? Ah, that's an interesting one. Um, goodness. I think probably, uh, oh gosh, maybe collaborate more. Um, so I, I guess like that, well, from a business perspective, um, if you're wanting to make a career as a dog photographer or as a pet photographer, um, you really need to focus on the business side of things um, and really uh, networking with other dog related businesses, even not dog related businesses, even businesses that are like where your target market and where your target client like goes. Um, And uh, like just, just really getting yourself out there and getting your name out there. It's not enough to just post stuff on social media. Like you really need to get out there in the community and, and, you know, create links with people. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's the biggest thing. Um, I guess when I first started out, I mean, I started my business in 2007 and Facebook wasn't really a, a thing until like a, f- a few years later. Um, so I guess I started building my business without social media, but I see so many photographers come on now and um, they've put a Facebook page up, maybe a website, and they're wondering why they're not getting clients. And it's because they're not doing all the other things that you really need to do. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess it's more so of a business type thing. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. No, no that, that, makes, that makes so much sense. Like when I got into this YouTube thing and even particularly with the podcast, uh, it's amazing how when you start these things, you learn how much of really about marketing you learn. Uh, even as a YouTube channel, you got to learn, I would think you got to learn a little bit of graphic design if you're not already yep. into it. Cause I mean, you're doing, you're adding stuff, right? It's all about the visuals and like the images. So that part, you probably have a head start in, um, with regard to yeah. that, but so much of it is like, if you just put it out and you just hope, yeah, maybe it'll go viral or maybe it'll get some viewership, but you can't beat the power of promotion collaborating and just talking to other experts in the field to grow your knowledge and then just getting better than you were yesterday. Um, so I just want to really, uh, thank you for, for coming on the podcast and, and, and sharing your knowledge and wealth of knowledge, I would say really with our audience, (laughs) with regard to your expertise in Photoshop and Lightroom and just getting the image and, and seeing our dogs be dogs. Um, just with that, where can we find you on social? Uh, I think you have a Facebook and an Instagram. What are your handles? Yeah, so I've got all those. Um, so if you want to follow my actual photography business, that's just Charlotte Reeves Photography. So it's Charlotte Reeves Photography on Facebook and also on Instagram, and it's just charlottereeves.com.au. Got to put the AU on the end. <laughs> um, we got an then, Aussie. Like, we got an Aussie. <laughs> that's it. We do. Um, so oh, and I, I went a little bit American for the um for the learn pet photography thing. So that's just .com. So that's just learnpetphotography.com. Kind of universal worldwide, you know. Um, and you can also find me on Facebook, Learn Pet Photography, and on Instagram, Learn Pet Photography. Um, so nice and easy, those two things you can follow me on both. So yeah. Oh, and YouTube, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> so YouTube, YouTube of course. Well, yes. Hey, thanks so much, Charlotte. We really appreciate you being on the show. Hopefully no we can do it thanks. again sometime. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me on. It was lovely. <laughs> Good to chat. You've just listened to an episode on the Dogs Are People 2 podcast presented by Dingle Days. If you like this episode, make sure to leave me a review on iTunes and share this episode with your friends on social media. Just don't forget to tag me at Dingle Days. If you want even more good stuff, make sure to go over to www.dingledaysphotography.com to find the show notes in our blog and head over to our Dingle Days community on YouTube so that you can connect with other followers of our training methods there. I can't wait to see you there. And thanks again for listening in. Until next time, continue to get after it and share your best life with your furry friend.